Chapters twenty five to twenty nine of Tristram Shandy, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman, Volume three by Lawrence Stern. Chapters twenty five to twenty nine. Chapter twenty five. "'Tis a point settled, and I mention it for the comfort of Confucius. Mr. Shandy is supposed to mean Esquire, member for, and not the Chinese legislator, who is apt to get entangled in telling a plain story, that, provided he keeps along the line of the story, he may go backwards and forwards as he will, tis still held to be no digression. This being premised, I take the benefit of the act of going backwards myself.' Chapter twenty six. Fifty thousand pannier loads of devils, not of the Archbishop of Beneventos, I mean of Rabelais' devils, with their tails chopped off by their rumps, could not have made so diabolical a scream of it as I did when the accident befell me. It summoned up my mother instantly into the nursery, so that Susanna had but just time to make her escape down the back stairs, as my mother came up the fore. Now, though I was old enough to have told the story myself, and young enough, I hope, to have done it without malignity, yet Susanna, in passing by the kitchen, for fear of accidents, had left it in the shorthand with the cook. The cook had told it with a commentary to Jonathan, and Jonathan to Obadiah, so that by the time my father had rung the bell half a dozen times, to know what was the matter above, was Obadiah enabled to give him a particular account of it, just as it had happened. I thought as much, said my father, tucking up his nightgown, and so walked upstairs. One would imagine from this, though for my own part I somewhat question it, that my father, before that time, had actually wrote that remarkable character in the Tristopedia, which to me is the most original and entertaining one in the whole book, and that is the chapter upon sash-windows, with a bitter philippic at the end of it, upon the forgetfulness of chambermaids. I have but two reasons for thinking otherwise. First, had the matter been taken into consideration before the event happened, my father certainly would have nailed up the sash-window for good and all, which, considering with what difficulty he composed books, he might have done with ten times less trouble than he could have wrote the chapter." This argument, I foresee, holds good against his writing a chapter, even after the event, but tis obviated under the second reason, which I have the honour to offer to the world in support of my opinion, that my father did not write the chapter upon sash-windows and chamber-pots at the time supposed, and it is this, that, in order to render the Tristopedia complete, I wrote the chapter myself. CHAPTER Twenty Seven. My father put on his spectacles, looked, took them off, put them into the case, all in less than a statutable minute, and without opening his lips turned about and walked precipitately downstairs. My mother imagined he had stepped down for lint and basilicon, but seeing him return with a couple of folios under his arm, and Obadiah following him with a large reading-desk, she took it for granted twas an herbal, and so drew him a chair to the bedside, that he might consult upon the case at his ease. "'If it be but right done,' said my father, turning to the section, de sede vel subjecto circumcisionis, for he had brought up Spencer de legibus hebreorum ritualibus and Maimonides, in order to confront and examine us altogether. "'If it be but right done,' quoth he, "'Only tell us,' cried my mother, interrupting him, "'what herbs?' "'For that,' replied my father, "'you must send for Dr. Slop.' My mother went down, and my father went on, reading the section as follows. "'Very well,' said my father. "'Nay, if it has that convenience, and so without stopping a moment to settle it first in his mind, whether the Jews had it from the Egyptians, or the Egyptians from the Jews,' He rose up, and, rubbing his forehead two or three times across with the palm of his hand, in the manner we rub out the footsteps of care, when evil has trod lighter upon us than we foreboded, he shut the book, and walked downstairs. "'Nay,' said he, 
mentioning the name of a different great nation upon every step as he set his foot upon it, if the Egyptians, the Syrians, the Phoenicians, the Arabians, the Cappadocians, if the Colchi and Troglodytes did it, if Solon and Pythagoras submitted, what is Tristam, who am I, that I should fret or fume one moment about the matter? CHAPTER Twenty Eight. "'Dear Yorick,' said my father, smiling, for Yorick had broke his rank with my uncle Toby in coming through the narrow entry, and so had stepped first into the parlour. This Tristam of ours, I find, comes very hardly by all his religious rites. Never was the son of Jew, Christian, Turk, or infidel initiated into them in so oblique and slovenly a manner. But he is no worse, I trust, said Yorick. There has been, certainly, continued my father, the deuce and all to do in some part or other of the ecliptic, when this offspring of mine was formed. That you are a better judge of than I, replied Yorick. Astrologers, quoth my father, know better than us both. The trine and sextile aspects have jumped awry, or the opposite of their ascendants have not hit it, as they should, or the lords of the genitures, as they call them, have been at Bow Peep, or something has been wrong above or below with us. "'Tis possible,' answered Yorick. "'But is the child,' cried my uncle Toby, "'the worse?' "'The troglodytes say not,' replied my father. "'And your theologists, Yorick, tell us.' "'Theologically,' said Yorick, "'or speaking after the manner of apothecaries.' "'Footnote in Greek philosophy. "'Statesmen?' "'Footnote in Greek. "'Or washerwomen?' "'Footnote in Greek, Bocart.' "'I'm not sure,' replied my father, "'but they tell us, Brother Toby, he's the better for it.' "'Provided,' said Yorick, "'you travel him into Egypt.' "'Of that,' answered my father, "'he will have the advantage when he sees the pyramids.' "'Now every word of this,' quoth my uncle Toby, "'is Arabic to me.' "'I wish,' said Yorick, "'twas so to half the world.' "'Illus,' footnote in Greek, San Chuniato, continued my father, circumcised his whole army one morning. Not without a court-martial, cried my uncle Toby. Though the learned, continued he, taking no notice of my uncle Toby's remark, but turning to Yorick, are greatly divided still who Illus was. Some say Saturn, some the supreme being, others no more than a brigadier-general under Pharaoh Necho. Let him be who he will, said my uncle Toby. I know not by what article of war he could justify it. The controvertists, answered my father, assign two and twenty different reasons for it. Others, indeed, who have drawn their pens on the opposite side of the question, have shown the world the futility of the greatest part of them. But then again our best polemic divines—I wish there was not a polemic divine, said Yorick, in the kingdom— one ounce of practical divinity is worth a painted shipload of all their reverences have imported these fifty years. Pray, Mr. Yorick, quoth my uncle Toby, do tell me what a polemic divine is. The best description, Captain Shandy, I have ever read, is of a couple of em, replied Yorick, in the account of the battle fought single hands betwixt gymnast and Captain Trippet, which I have in my pocket. I beg I may hear it, quoth my uncle Toby earnestly. "'You shall,' said Yorick. "'And as the corporal is waiting for me at the door, "'and I know the description of a battle "'will do the poor fellow more good than his supper, "'I beg, brother, you'll give him leave to come in.' "'With all my soul,' said my father. "'Trim came in, erect and happy as an emperor, "'and having shut the door, "'Yorick took a book from his right-hand coat pocket, "'and read, or pretended to read, as follows. CHAPTER Twenty Nine. Which words being heard by all the soldiers which there were, diverse of them being inwardly terrified, did shrink back and make room for the assailant? All this did Gymnast very well remark and consider, and therefore, making as if he would have alighted from off his horse, as he was poising himself on the mounting side, he most nimbly, with his short sword by this thigh, shifting his feet in the stirrup, and performing the stirrup-leather feet whereby, after the inclining of his body downwards, he forthwith launched himself aloft into the air, and placed both his feet together upon the saddle, standing upright, with his back turned towards his horse's head. "'Now,' said he, "'my case goes forward.' 
Then suddenly, in the same posture wherein he was, he fetched a gamble upon one foot, and, turning to the left hand, failed not to carry his body perfectly round, just into his former position, without missing one jot. "'Ha!' said Trippet, "'I will not do that at this time, and not without cause. "'Well,' said Gymnast, "'I have failed. I will undo this leap.' Then, with a marvellous strength and agility, turning towards the right hand, he fetched another striking gamble as before, which done, he set his right hand thumb upon the bow of the saddle, raised himself up, and sprung into the air, poising and upholding his whole weight upon the muscle and nerve of the said thumb, and so turned and whirled himself about three times, at the fourth, reversing his body and overturning it upside down and foreside back, without touching anything, he brought himself betwixt the horse's two ears, and then giving himself a jerking swing, he seated himself upon the crupper. "'This can't be fighting,' said my uncle Toby. The corporal shook his head at it. "'Have patience,' said Yorick. Then Trippet passed his right leg over his saddle, and placed himself en croupe. But, said he, "'twere better for me to get into the saddle.' Then, putting the thumbs of both hands upon the crupper before him, and thereupon leaning himself, as upon the only supporters of his body, he incontinently turned heels over head in the air, and straight found himself betwixt the bow of the saddle in a tolerable seat. Then, springing into the air with a somerset, he turned him about like a windmill, and made above a hundred frisks, turns, and demi-pomadas. "'Good God!' cried Trim, losing all patience. One home thrust of a bayonet is worth it all. I think so too, replied Yorick. I am of a contrary opinion, quoth my father. End of chapters twenty five to twenty nine. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. November two thousand nine in San Diego, California.